Hi, hello, hello everyone. Um, thank you for being here. My name is Ida Cutler. I'm a bookseller at Women and Children First. Uh, we, for those of you who don't know us, we're one of the last remaining feminist bookstores in the United States. Uh, we're honored to be here tonight to celebrate the release of Respect the Mic, celebrating 20 years of poetry from a Chicagoland high school. Over here. Uh, we begin our virtual events as we begin our events held in the store with a land acknowledgement. Please join me in acknowledging that the land on which the bookstore stands is the unceded territory of the Peoria, Potawatomi, and Miami people. There are over 75,000 indigenous people living in Illinois, and we strive to recognize and honor native literature and communities. We encourage you to learn more about land acknowledgements and the rightful owners of the land where you are viewing tonight's event. Going beyond land acknowledgement to the work on the ground, we also encourage folks to research their local indigenous-led land back organizations. For us in Chicago, we uplift the ongoing work of the American Indian Center of Chicago. A little bit about uh, the store, Women and Children First. Um, we will be opening this Saturday at limited capacity for in-store browsing. Uh, we also continue to offer curbside pickup and we ship anywhere in the US. Our online store is always open and we love your orders. So uh, on all of our upcoming events will continue to be virtual and you can check out our schedule on our website, womenandchildrenfirst.com slash event. A uh, few housekeeping notes before we get started. Um, be sure to drop your questions in the Q&A box uh, under your screen um, or in the chat and we'll get to them at the end of the readings. Throughout the event, um, I will also be periodically dropping a link to Women and Children First website to order this book um, if you haven't yet uh, done so. Now, it is my honor to introduce Peter Kahn, who put together that slideshow that you just saw and is a big reason all of us are here on this screen tonight. Uh, a former Chicago social worker, Peter Kahn has been an English teacher since 1994 and a spoken word educator since 2003 at Oak Park River Forest High School. His students can be seen in Louder Than a Bomb and America to Me. A founding member of the London poetry collective Malika's Kitchen, he co-founded the London Teenage Poetry Slam, and as a visiting fellow at Goldsmith University of London, created the Spoken Word Education Training Program. Peter was a featured speaker at the National Council of Teachers of English's annual convention and runner-up in the NCTE and Penguin Random House Maya Angelou Teacher Award for Poetry. Along with Patricia Smith and Ravi Shankar, he edited the Golden Shovel Anthology, New Poems Honoring Gwendolyn Brooks, reviewed in the New York Times by Claudia Rankin. Peter's 2020 poetry collection, Little Kings, has poems featured in the London Guardian and the Forward Book of Poetry. Uh, everybody, Peter Kahn. Hey, thank you, Ida. Thank you all for being here. I am beyond excited about tonight and this book. So I want to start with some thank yous. Um, thank you to Ida and H. Mel and Sarah from Women and Children First for hosting us. Thank you to Jennifer D. and Rachel Sonis and the Penguin and Penguin Workshop team for making this book possible. The same for Hannah Bratasani from the Frederick Agency. This would not be here without all of those people. Um, thank you all at home for being here, especially the Oak Park River Forest High School community, the teachers, Spoken Word Club alumni and current students, the poets who are here who have taught us craft and inspired us, and uh, my family, particularly my parents, my sister and my nephew Griffin in Columbus, Ohio, home of the Buckeyes. So I'm gonna provide a little bit of context for the book and a little bit about the night, and then I'll do some introductions and we'll get started with some poetry. So this book has 76 poems in it. The process started about three and a half years ago. So when we first got poems, some of the students were 14 years old um, and about 40% were in high school, but some of them were graduates who were in their mid thirties. So it's a nice range of age when the poems were written and a nice range of poems. Frankly, we could have had at least 500 poems from students and alumni from our program and made a great book but we had to make it manageable. So this is just a sampling of the talent that's come through our program over the years. Um, for the night, after the introductions, you're gonna hear five poems from the collection and then we'll do a Q&A and it should be fun. So 
I have the honor of introducing my three co-editors, and I'm very excited to be able to do that. So first off, we have Hanif abdur -Ki. So I first heard about Hanif from my British friend, Raymond Antrobus, the summer of 2016, when I was in London and we were trading names we should know. And he said, you got to check out this poet, Hanif abdur -Ki. And I did, and I started teaching some of his poems in the classroom, and we invited him to be our master writing workshop leader in the, the spring of 2017. He came, kids loved him, and that became a, a friendship that started with Hanif and me. I, I'm lucky to call him a friend. He is a cultural icon and hero in Columbus, Ohio, home of the Buckeyes. And I'm just gonna go over some of his, his immense bio. So he's a National Book Award and National Book Critics Circle finalist. He may win that award. That was just announced recently. He's a MacArthur Genius Grant recipient, the winner of the 2020 Lenore, Lenore Marshall Prize for Poetry, and recently the 2022 Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence for Nonfiction Writing. So we'll be hearing from Hanif later in the Q&A. My next co-editor is the wonderful Franny Choi. I first met Franny through uh, Sully at his sandbox, his urban sandbox, probably around 2013 or 14, and then saw her wow the crowd at Split This Rock Festival in the spring of 2014. And I invited her to submit to the Golden Shovel Anthology. And fortunately enough for all of us, she did. And she's in that. And then we invited her to come to Oak Park. And as you saw in the photo, she was our master writing workshop leader in 2016. And I, I've been using her poem, uh, Mud, over the years to teach extended metaphor. It's one of the best teaching poems I've ever used. And we're using one of her name poems right now. So we're really lucky to have Franny with us. Um, a little bit from her bio. She's the 2019 Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Fellow. She's currently an Arthur Levitt Jr. Artist in Residence at Williams College. Her latest book is Soft Science. And I just found out from a very excited Kara Jackson that she's also, Franny is also teaching at Smith College. And then finally, my other co-editor is Dan Sully Sullivan. I've known him the longest. I've known him since 1998 when he was a student in my American Lit class when I was an English teacher. That didn't go so well for a while, um, but fortunately on his 17th birthday, his dad had an idea, what if we utilize poetry to hook Dan in school? And the rest is kind of history. He went on to earn a BA from Columbia College, a double master's degree from Indiana. Along the way, when I went to London in 2001, he co-led Spoken Word Club, and then for many years, we co-led it together. He's a good friend of mine. He's the, the father, along with... Uh, Whitney, the mother of two adorable kids, and a little bit from his bio. He's a three-time Chicago Poetry Slam champion, a recipient of the Gwendolyn Brooks Open Mic Poetry Award, the Earl S. Ho Award for Excellence in Teaching Creative Writing, and an Indiana University Writer in South Asia recipient. And I hope you enjoyed the photos of him from about 1999 or 2000. He had a little bit of a beard, but not quite like he has now. So we're gonna hear from Sully and then I'll introduce the other contributors and then Sully will introduce Langston. After they read their poem from Respect the Mic, they're also gonna talk a little bit about the impact of Spoken Word Club and what it felt like to first hold this book in their hands. But right now, please give a warm virtual welcome to Dan Sully Sullivan. Hi, all. Um, yes, uh, in high school, I, I did not have a mustache, just kind of a spidery thing happening here. Um, and uh, I had lots of Tommy Hilfiger clothes that made swishing noises. Um, I, like Pete said, uh, I'm glad he, he, he brought this up tonight because the, the, he's, he's used the, that story of the fact that I, I did not do well in his class. I was an unmotivated student. Um, and I went from the lowest grade in all of his English classes one semester to with after using poetry as a it's kind of an intervention, uh, you know, the best grade in his classes um, the second semester. And um, that was a story that Pete told for, for many years with the Spoken Word Club. 
And when I was around um, may, maybe 35 years old, I kind of said, hey, hey Pete, I'm, I'm entering uh, sort of the middle age phase of my life. Uh, maybe the failed high school student <laughs> story can, uh, can, can shift a bit now. Um, and, and that's how we end up here now. Uh, and it is true, I need to own that, that part, right? And that's, that's something that poetry did for me. And um, the Spoken Word Club, I was a founding student my, my senior year of high school, and then the, the year directly after, I did a poetry residency assisting Avery R. Young um, in the classroom, and I got hooked, and um, I, I haven't left the classroom since. Um, so um, I was a part of the Spoken Word Club. I've always been a part of the Spoken Word Club in one way or another over its, its years, but I was co-sponsor of the club for 13 years, and uh, it just will... Um, it's, it's the only other major through line other than my own family um, that uh, has been there through my adult life. Um, it's, uh, it runs through, through the timeline of my life, like the blue line. Um, so um, it's, it's meant so much to me. It means so much to me to be uh, a part of this project. I'm so thankful for everybody who's um, uh, helped bring this book into fruition. Um, when it arrived the other day, you know, for whatever reason, I, I didn't know it was even going to be hardcover coming out, but it's it's so gorgeous. The texture of it feels wonderful. Um, it's got uh, not only OPRF colors, uh, but Chicago Bear colors, and um, I, I'm just so excited for it. So with that said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read my poem from the anthology, um, and uh, yeah, just shout out to everybody for, for being here today. Um, what, a, what a celebration, what a great day it is. And I can find a home there too. When mom lost some of her hearing, shout out to my mom, you just saw her in the chat. When mom lost some of her hearing, the noise of traffic and city buses at the curb out front drove forward from the backdrop of our minds and pulled up at our dinner table in Brighton Park house on the corner of 42nd and California. I went to Peace Lutheran for kindergarten and missed the crossing guard when she was hospitalized after a hit and run. We moved to Oak Park, first suburb west of the city. It was a lot closer to downtown, but that city limit spoke volumes. In the 50s, they built cul-de-sacs all down Austin Ave at the edge of town. It was less about holding and more about keeping out. Ludacris and Hemingway, both went to my high school, not at the same time. I guess I'm asking, who gets to speak for the city? I lived in Chicago more years than anywhere else, but what is mine to hold, if anything? Maybe I thought I was part of the landscape, some urban pastoral romance that connected me to place. Where am I even from? Rakim said, it ain't where you're from, it's where you're at. And Edward Sharp said, home is wherever I'm with you. Our CD player doesn't work, so Whitney and I flip radio stations a lot when driving between Illinois and Indiana. I lean more toward a Rakim ethos. I don't think Edward Sharp is even one person, but I do think he's white. So what truth can I live in? Chicago was never mine. That doesn't mean I can't love it. It does mean I can leave. It means there's another landscape and I can find a home there too. So with that uh, out of the way, I'm going to introduce our next reader. Um, is that all right, Please. Pete? That's Sully, I'm, I'll introduce the next reader. You'll introduce, oh. I'll, we'll come back for Langston. Gotcha. Give it up for dance. Oh. And that poem kicks off rightfully so, the anthology, right? Um, a lot of history there. Thank you, Dan, for everything. All right, so next up, we have the class of 2019, Karina Robinson. She's one of a handful of students that was in all 12 of her spoken word showcases during her high school career, three a year. She's a two-time member of Louder Than a Bomb. 
She earned a full tuition scholarship to University of Wisconsin-Madison through the First Wave program she's a part of, and she's the younger sister of spoken word legend Christian Robinson. She's also one of the best leaders we've ever had in the club. So please welcome to the virtual stage, Karina Robinson. Good to see you, Karina. Good to see you too, PK. Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll just read the poem that I have and respect the mic. Um, this, title, this piece is titled Blood Money. Dear feminine product companies, do us all a favor and stop investing in happy girls doing yoga. It's going to take battlefields of blood for me to show interest in your tampons. No more flowers, blue silk, or music that really belongs in Barbie commercials. Give me walking dead level screams of terror. I want the real. Stop hyping up how thin and discreet your period products are when the packaging has a Jurassic Park in every crinkle. See, I want a company that knows it is every girl's dream to be a female panda. The only mammal that ovulates for one week, once a year. If bleeding is our jobs, turning us into pandas is yours. Give me less ways to offend the classroom when I ask to use the bathroom while pulling out that magic wand of cotton and more ways to apologize for that thing that will happen to every person with a vagina. When the boy in my class asks how to get a period, I tell him it is simple. Put on your nicest, fanciest underwear and wait for karma to do the rest. Dear feminine product companies, there is a woman at the food pantry I volunteer at with five daughters. I have been sneaking extra tampons into her cart faster than a retreating switchblade. My manager scolds me and forgets that he has daughters too. And the cost of existing while female doesn't care about whose bank account it is slurping from. Take my blood money and make use of it. Fund research that will turn us into pandas. That kind of a woman for only seven days out of a whole year. Dear feminine product companies, my mom and I talk trash about you more than the white boys I go to school with. She knows everything you have done and has kept an eternal list. You monetize my body without remorse. Make hypocrites of yourselves and say it is empathy. I am done paying extra for my razors, my deodorant, my lotion, shampoo, conditioner, and your paycheck. You think reparations come in the color pink and the scent of exotic fruit, like your body odor doesn't need just as much help as mine does. You tax me more for my tampons and less for your condoms. And don't they end up in the same body part anyway? Doesn't that body part belong only to me? You call my body your business plan make a trajectory of nature and all the ways you can manipulate her. As if women didn't give birth to you. As if your daughters don't bleed too. Um, so that's the poem, thank you. Um, what has Spoken Word Club done for me? What has Spoken Word Club not done for me is more the question. Um, I think the, the biggest thing that I always think of when I look back at Spoken Word in my time there is that um, I always knew that I had a voice just as a, as a student, as a woman of color, um, as a biracial woman of color. Um, but I, I, I don't think I realized that my voice mattered as much as it did. And I didn't care about my voice as much as I did until I was in spoken word. Um, and so I think that just with the help of PK and um, Adam Levin and even Christian Robinson, my brother, um, when I was in spoken word club and he was uh, a co-runner of the club at the time, um, just really helped me feel strong in my own voice um, and, and just more confident to the point where, you know, I can take what I learned there into college and still write poetry in college and still like the poetry that I write in college. And so that's, that's one of the biggest things of many that Spoken Word Club has done for me. Um, getting to hold Respect the Mic in my hands for the first time was so amazing. I think that it's an honor to not just say that I made so many friends in spoken word, but to also be able to say that like some of my favorite poets are my friends is just crazy to me. Um, and so, you know, I've been, in a, I've been an alumna of spoken word for like two and a half, three years now. And 
Um, you know, you remember, you remember just, you know, some of your favorite lines that you hear throughout your time there. Um, my friends have created some of my all time favorite metaphors I've ever heard in poetry before. Um, but I've only been able to honor that through memory, right? And so, you know, I'm walking down the street to class one day and I'm like, dang, that, that line that that one person wrote is so good and I wish I could hear that poem again. Um, and so getting to hold Respect the Mic was like, this is my physical like playlist, top 100 hits um, that I, I don't have to honor through memory anymore. I can read it whenever I want to. Um, and, and still just, it felt so satisfactory to hold that in my hands for the first time. Um, so yeah, thank you guys very much. And I will pass it back to PK. Thank you, Karina. And those in the audience see how fortunate a human being I am that I've got to work with people like Karina and get paid to do it. It's, it's ridiculous. Um, so thank you, Karina. Um, next up is Ibrahim Mokhtar. So we had to split time with Ibrahim in wrestling. So he was a wrestler and in spoken word along with several other people, including uh, one or two in the anthology. So on one slight level, I was always hoping for an injury, not a major injury, just enough that, you know, he wouldn't go to practice and he'd come join us again. Um, Ibrahim's a senior at University of Southern California. He just told me he's going to take a gap year and then go to medical school, which is pretty awesome, right? A poet going to medical school. We have several in the book who've done that as well. Um, Ibrahim is one of the nicest young men I've ever had the opportunity to work with. So I'm really honored that he's here with us tonight. Please welcome Ibrahim. Hey, uh, what's going on everybody? Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Just want to make sure my computer's been a little funky on Zoom okay all day. Yeah. Cool, appreciate it. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and get started with my piece as well. I'll be reading from the book, take the cover off. Um, but yeah, so this piece is titled Family Name. Poetry is the lecithin in my life, the emulsifier holding me together. I could be at my house and still not be home because I was always too Sudanese to be American, yet too American to be Sudanese. We've always been viewed differently, whether we were Roman Madison Street or Khartoum. My mom's hijab was her cape and armor. I promise y'all will never understand. The day we tore our roots, I lay silently in my mother's lap. Her eight siblings bellowed at her simultaneously as layers of hijab hid the tears cascading down her cheeks. The day we tore our roots, I learned that my calluses were ugly to them. Abraham or Ibrahim, I was neither. I was family only by name. The day we tore our roots, I was in Sudan visiting family. My dad traveled to see his mom just across town. A seemingly simple trip. The day we tore our roots, my family told my mother she had no choice but to stay in Sudan. Days of mourning slipped by the day we tore our roots. I asked my mother why we hadn't said goodbye to anyone as we started our six mile walk to the airport. I remember writing Ash'ar till my wrists gave out. Lying on 300 square feet of glossy wood floors, I'd wait on my mom to come home after 12 hour shifts. Blisters on her feet, a fake smile on her face. She'd always tell me, God does everything for a reason. It took me years to believe her, but every verse fortified my wrists and every performance engraved confidence in my ribs until I finally embraced the Sudan with them. So that's the piece. Uh, so I'll get the cover back on the book. Yeah, so um, to talk about what spoken word meant to me, I'm glad I got such a, a, a lovely intro by Mr. Khan, but the reality is in high school, I was a knucklehead. Uh, and I really, I really did love poetry and I loved writing and, um, Mr. Khan and Mr. Levin would come around to all the English classes at OPRF and we kind of had this like poetry week where we would just, you know, Mr. Khan and Mr. Levin, Levin would cycle through all of the um, English classes and they would have us, um, you know, do a week where we're writing poetry, 
Um, and then by the end of the week, we were performing. And I remember, I remember loving it, but also trying to not, you know, I, I had my other priorities and I was always telling Mr. Khan and Mr. Levin, oh, I couldn't do it. And I'd always show up to the first couple spoken word meetings where like the non-committal ones where you weren't in a group for the showcase. And then I would drop off. Um, and, and frankly, like looking back, um, one of the biggest, biggest regrets I have is not <laughs> listening to Mr. Collin and Mr. Levin and being like, just starting earlier. Um, and obviously I still got, um, you know, did follow through with a couple showcases, but um, I just have such fond memories of not only like the other individuals in spoken word, but just how much that space meant to me in high school, even though I wasn't involved with it uh, nearly as long as I should have been. And um, I truly can't thank Mr. Khan and Mr. Levin enough. They were, they were father figures to me. Um, I remember distinctly, uh, to this day, I still hate physics. I, I always will hate physics but um, I would sneak away from my physics classes in high school and go to the spoken word office and Mr. Levin would chew me out or Mr. Khan, whoever was there and they'd go back to class. Um, but, you know, I'd, I'd always be trying to sneak off to, to go to the office and, and um, you know, I, I always felt safe there and I always felt like I could be myself. Um, and I'm sure, uh, a lot of us feel the same way and like kind of echoing what Karina said, I do think a lot of us found our voice in um, spoken word club and a big part of that was the environment that was created by um, not only Mr. Khan, Mr. Lev and all the other um, individuals who are involved in running it, but all of the students. Um, I really uh, um, am so fortunate and so blessed to even like be and, and to circle back to this, um, so, so blessed and so fortunate to even be in this book with these, some of these people who I consider the most talented writers and poets ever. Um, I mean, so many people that I look up to um, as far as writing goes. I mean, that be it Karina or Leah Kindler or um, all the other people older, younger than me, who um, I think are, are just absolutely amazing. Um, and, um, to, to see this one, my mom still, still doesn't know about this and she's got one coming in the mail, which I'm excited to see how she acts about that and how that goes. But, um, seeing this and feeling this is, is, it's surreal. It's surreal, you know, and I, I'm, I can only say thank you and that I'm, I'm grateful for my experience, not only in the club, but to even be surrounded by such talented, amazing individuals. Thank you, Ibrahim. That was lovely. Um, so next up, we have Majesty Gunn. Majesty is a senior at Southern Illinois University. Senior or, yeah, senior. Uh, so class of 2018 from Oak Park. Uh, Majesty is studying exercise science and is also a cancer rehabilitation trainer. She's the older sister of Grace Gunn, who's also in the anthology, and Majesty is one of the best captains in the history of the club. Whenever there was a, a new kids who I wanted to make sure would have a really good experience, I would make sure they were with Majesty. So it's great to see you, Majesty. Please, everyone, welcome Majesty to the virtual stage. Wow. Okay. Well, thank you. That was amazing. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, I, I will read from this wonderful book with amazing people in it. Um, this poem is called My Cousin's High. My grandfather was a smoker. It's what killed him. The same smoke could end my cousins too. My grandma is resilient. I'm hoping the residue from her hugs lands in my attitude. I know people who hold heartbreak like hot rocks. They let it match in their hands while wallowing in smoky rooms. I think that's me. I think I want attention. Maybe I'm the constant in every relationship because I can't break up with me, because I can't let go of who I am, a doormat to anyone who walks into me. I welcome them in and leave the door open like an abyss. They come and go as they like. Maybe I'm the lesson they're being taught. Maybe I'm the placeholder in the equation, just an X waiting to happen. 
They always seem to be stronger when they leave me like shoe prints them with me left on their soul. They just get what they need from the foyer of the put together pieces of me just to leave me in pieces. Maybe I should have crockered a little more. Maybe I shouldn't have let them pass. I've never smoked before. I get high off an encounter. Maybe I am the problem, the one you're supposed to solve. My cousins are all smokers. Maybe that's the only way they feel anything. I feel everything. That's the poem. Um, uh, being a part of spoken word was the most wonderful thing I could have ever gotten from my high school career. Um, everything that I am today comes from family, comes from track, comes from um, so many different things, but spoken word just built me so strong and made me the leader that I am today, made me the person that I want to be later in life, made me want to do better, help, helped me learn how to take care of others and take care of myself at the same time and to say how I feel. Um, it helped me gain a platform for myself. Um, my first year when I did this, when I did spoken word, um, I automatically got put into the MC as at the MLK um, speech or uh, uh, thing at the school. And I was like, Miss Khan, why'd you do that? <laughs> what'd, you, what'd you do that for? Um, and I was just like, he just would press me into everything, never letting me sit down, always letting me know that I can do better and I'm destined for greater. So I'm thankful to him, to Adam, to every single person that I was in spoken word with, every single little that I had, every person he put under me, I, I see them grow now like, and I'm like, wow, I can't believe I get to be a part of their story a little bit. Um, so I'm so happy to be a part of this story and to be a part of everything that this book is. When I got it in the mail, I sent it to everyone I loved first. I took a picture, I was like, guys, look, look at me. <laughs> and then um, I was like, page, um, 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 page 84, it's me, it's me in here. And then my sister's in here too. And for me to be chosen out of the millions of poems that people um, could have sent um, and could have been a part of, I was chosen. I, I still, every time Mr. Khan chooses me for something, I'm like, why me? And he oftentimes always gives me reassurance that this is why me, because I can. Um, and so I'm so glad and grateful to be a part of this. Um, I'm so thankful. Um, I'm gonna stop saying um and just say thank you. So thank you. Sully, you're up. Thank you, Majesty. Are you there, Dan Sullivan? Technical difficulties. I'm here. All right. Um, thank you, Majesty. Uh, one more round for, for Majesty. Um, I want to give you a little background um, here, just a little context. Back in high school, our next reader, um, gave up on his hoop dreams to join the spoken word club uh, which is which is great for all of us here tonight uh, but it's unfortunate because i always thought uh, he could have been the next larry bird after oprf he earned his ba in english with a minor in archery from the university of michigan then an mfa in creative writing from boston university and during that time he also moonlit as a third baseman for the boston red sox and was quite good considering um, what, I, what I'm saying is he, he wears a lot of hats, mostly snapbacks from the lids in North Riverside Park Mall, but, but hats nonetheless. I've been so proud to see this guy's trajectory, but honestly, I never, I never did doubt his success in life. He's always been hardworking, kind-hearted, humble to your face for the most part, and just, just a delight to be around. His comedic musings have been featured upstairs at Doc Ryan's in Forest Park, haphazardly on Twitter, and is the second spoken word club member to have appeared on HBO. You've seen him on Insecure on HBO, The Boys on Amazon Prime, Bless This Mess on ABC, Southside on Comedy Central. He's the lead, write lead writer for HBO's Pause with Sam J and will appear with J, Chris Red, and Jack Knight on Peacock's upcoming series, Bust Down. Please respect the mic and send some big love up for the Larry Bird of network comedy, my <laughs> friend and yours, Langston Kerman. Yeah, all right. What a beautiful introduction. <laughs> I love that so much. It was, that was beautiful. This, this entire evening has been, it's been great. Sully, uh, he, he, he sort of vaguely mentioned it but he was at the, the first attempt of comedy I ever did. 
and he was very kind to not tell me how terrible I was and and uh, we've maintained that relationship for a long time I think of of someone not telling me how bad I am at the thing that I'm attempting to do and uh, Mr. Khan has taken a, a very different approach. He tells me when he hates the things that I'm doing uh, very openly and outwardly. And, and I appreciate that feedback too. It's all, it's all real helpful feedback that it, that helps your boy, you know, become the best person I can be. <laughs> I, uh, I'm going to read my poem and uh, yeah, this, this piece uh, is called, who does this feeling belong to? I am nearly positive there are no other Langston Kermans on this smoking earth, certainly not in this neighborhood. How frightening to think there might be another who appropriates the prescriptions for my abscess, who claims my lost packages, who watches anime and sucks juice between his teeth the same as me. I am 32 years old, I'm 34 now, but you know, books take a while. I'm 34 years old and I have never known anyone's heart attacks in the morning shower. No monoxide pumped into a closed garage, no true loss. Even my first dog lived to 17. She died quietly on a metal table, the family encircling her like a fleshy halo. Dearest other Langston, how many eggs have you cracked to find the yolk pecked with blood? All right, that's, that's the, the poem. Uh, I haven't written poetry in quite some time, which I'm I'm always embarrassed about when I when I rejoin this circle because of how I think uh, important and meaningful poetry was and continues to be to to this community, and and I think in a beautiful way I I owe so much of the thing so so much of everything that I do to. The things that I learned in Spoken Word Club from Sully, I'm going to call him Mr. Sullivan, since we're calling Adam Mr. Levin this evening, from Mr. Sullivan and Mr. Khan. Uh, it's, it's, it, I, I just think this club, this community has really taught me so much of what it means to like truly write, uh, not just my, my thoughts down, but really how to dig into the, the nooks and the crannies and the nuances of of what it you know what I'm thinking what I'm feeling and really make those those feelings and and thoughts something more fantastic and then you get to see I had the blessing of being able to uh, struggle uh, through college and then get out of college and become uh, Mr. Khan's assistant and getting to see young people uh, embrace that same community and learn those same tricks and sort of make something of themselves uh, via those same skills that I was blessed with uh, when I was studying under uh, Sully and Mr. Khan. And so I, I'm just super grateful. And I think this book is amazing. And, and obviously it's, it's just a culmination of so many different people's uh, relationship to this community. And so it's nice to be able to like look through it and be like, oh, I remember that person, or oh, I never, Mr. I, me and keep up pretty regularly, and so I hear about people that I don't get a chance to actually uh, talk to, and so or or meet in person, and so this is a cool opportunity to really see who they are, at least for a moment in time, and uh, hopefully they're still writing poetry and not uh, dumb, weird, offensive things like I've opted to do. So yeah, I'm, I'm grateful for this and I'm grateful for, for all those involved that helped make it. And it's, it's dope, thank you. All right, wow, so awesome, so good. One more virtual round of applause for everybody who read tonight. Um, I'm personally blown away myself. Um, it, uh, we're gonna do a Q and A right now so all everybody who is a panelist can come uh back on the screen i'm going to uh ask the ask the questions yeah give it give it up for everyone um and uh i'm going to ask the questions and it'll just go to you know if we can't figure out who it specifically applies to um someone will just take it away so uh here we go i'll start with this one cuz it was in um, the chat, 
but uh oh this is this is for you this is for you peter um did you give the poets any guidelines or prompts for their pieces for the book or did you just tell them to write well one of the things we we preach in spoken word club is the use of specific incident which i learned from one of my mentors roger robinson who learned it from kwame dawes and it's a way of putting your thumbprint on a poem and grounding it so really that was our only ask and, and sully um can speak to this too, but pretty much it's been three and a half years, but I think that was it, you know, involve a specific incident, obviously avoid cliche, include striking lines, all the things that we taught over the years. Uh, Sully, anything else you want to add? Mm -mm. No, you covered it. All right. Um, this is, uh, for, for everyone, how has your poetry style fluctuated at different stages of life and your education? Uh, I'll, I'll start. I can answer. Uh, I, I think, uh, spoken word when, when I was first in the club, we were writing like three minute poems sometimes. Like, I, I think that that was some of the, like, I can't remember the exact time limit. I'm very old at this point, but there was a point where we were sort of like capped at three minutes. And then I got older and I probably stopped writing poems that exceeded 20 lines. Uh, I think it, you just learn to, or at least personally, I've really started to value being concise and wanting it to all fit on a single page. And some of that meant that uh, things got really short and maybe probably could have used a little more explanation, but I also, uh, I, I didn't really care to, to necessarily make it as, as large of a performance as I had in the past. So it was a sort of a transition into a, a quieter poet, if that makes sense. Does anybody else want to answer that question for themselves? Uh, I'll just I'll just echo that to say that the process of uh, writing poems is always to move closer, um, and that's that's closer to the world around us and closer to to the self, right? Uh, closer to yourself. So um, as that happens, um, you know, it's it's a you look at the larger sphere and it it, it circles inward. Um, so. Uh, I think that becomes the process, especially after so many years with the Spoken Word Club. Um, we look at the larger performances. We want to, um, we want our voices. The first time we get a taste of what it feels like to to be uh, truly heard and seen within the community, uh, we want that to echo through the hallways. Um, and. Uh, as as you gain experience, the more you work on it, uh, yeah, those poems uh, tend to tighten up, become shorter, less performative because you're moving you're moving in toward the self. And, uh, I think you learn vulnerability through the process. I like this these these question this next question. There there's two, but I'm gonna combine them into one um, from, from Melanie asks, uh, what do you do if you're at a roadblock with trying to get inspiration in writing a poem? And how do you know if you've written a good poem? I'd love to hear from, from Franny and Hanif on this one, please, if you don't mind. Um. Well, for the latter point, I, I don't think I ever asked myself, I'll put it like this. I, I think it's really important for writers and consumers of popular culture and all these things to not, um, to work outside of these binary questions and ask ourselves, did I do something good or not? The question I always ask myself is, do I think that I have done the best I can with the tools I have at my disposal today? Because the reality for me, at least, is every time I sit down to write something new, I am picking up something uh, that I can bring back to the page with me. And so um, there's a limitless kind of pleasure to that. But, uh, and by, by even sit down and write, I also mean by entering the world, I'm, I'm taking things back that I can bring to the page and enhance my work. And so the question then doesn't become, is this good or is this bad? For me, it's, am I satisfied with how far I've pushed the limits of what I'm capable of in this moment? 
And um, that alone feels like an achievement if the answer is yes, you know, the answer is honestly yes. Um, and I also think that just helps me stay uh, a bit optimistic about my own craft, which isn't always, not always easy. Yeah, Neef, I love that. Um, I love that definition. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll touch on the other part of the question on what to do if you're, uh, if you encounter a roadblock um, on the way to writing a poem. I often find that that roadblock is actually just um, kind of a mean voice in my head, you know, um, that's saying like, that's cliche, that's not good enough, like everybody's written about that before. Um, and so I have I've developed over the years a lot of different um, tricks to try to quiet that voice, including just like putting on really loud music to distract her or um, uh, uh, yeah, using like a prompt or cutting things up or whatever. Um, but I, I think that that developing the like lots of different tricks to, to quiet that and, and, you know, return to that later, but in the process of writing a poem, really just ask the question like, what do I need to say? What feels the most exciting and real and generative to say? And like, like, am I being honest? Am I being as honest as I possibly can? Um, yeah. And I think that, you know, if, if I, if I would say anything about the other question about um, writing, how do you know if you've written a good poem? I think like in some ways that's like, what writing in community is all about. Like, does this feel like accountable and loving to the people that I care about? Um, and does it feel exciting to the people that I care about as it, at the same time as being um, true to myself? And so, yeah, I don't know, I guess just to bring it back to like the this whole theme of, of the, the like magic of writing with and alongside other people um, that everybody has been talking about tonight. Um, yeah, I think that's a magic at the heart of all of the work that we are doing. And what I, I was at, so one quick thing, because Franny got me thinking about like, what I loved about SLAM, like I, I was introduced to poetry through SLAM. Like I didn't, I don't have any kind of educational background in poetry, didn't even think about it in high school. And so SLAM was my first entry into poetry. And why I got into SLAM wasn't because of competition, it's because I loved the real time exchange with an audience, like sonically, right? To hear when people were pleased with something, right? Um, that's how I found my people and my, 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 the kind of writers I loved. And um, so there's something about this too, like Spoken Word Club or Poetry Slam that um, can provide some kind of guide post just based off of when you feel good and when other people feel good, that's kind of like the intersection of pleasure and a poem. Awesome. Um, this one is from Gianni. Um, for the editors, what was the most difficult, unexpected part of such a long publishing process? Um, I guess I'll go first. Um, well, something right now. So we, we just had a sophomore poetry slam the other day. And the talent in, of those six 16 finalists part of it is i wish it went longer so i could have included them in the anthology as well so there's it's almost <laughs> there are so many alumni who, who aren't a part of it who are amazing so part of it is that if it was short and quick maybe i wouldn't bemoan that as much um and wish that it was a 500 poem anthology um that and then you know along the way some of our uh spoken word family passed away and you know those names are mentioned at the beginning of the book, but just you know they're they're kids in my mind. So the idea that some of these kids have passed away that's that's been really difficult along the way, obviously too. Um, so I'll pass it on to let's say Sully. Yeah, I mean I think one of the most difficult things is we've got um, uh, twenty years of poets um, that have been through this program, and uh, there's. Um, 65 students per showcase, approximately 65, 75. Um, and you just can't include that many people in, in one book. Um, but there are so many deserving poets who, who um, could have made their way into this book for sure. Um, I'll also say that as far as difficulty, mm, I, I, I'm not sure 
I'm not sure how to quite answer that other than um, I will say um, I was originally slated to be an associate editor of this book um, and and uh, Pete and Hanif and Franny were very kind in bringing me on as another editor and I, I learned so much from them through the process and um, I'm used to digging into individual poems and and red penning a sheet and um, you know trying to hone in on on craft right on a line level um, but thinking around a collection of this magnitude um, how poems fit together uh, where they belong uh, in the collection and um, looking for the natural themes that arise. Uh, it was really a wonder to, to watch them work and, and guide that process. I think for me, I, I, there was no real challenge. I think there was like a lot of pleasure in the sequencing process in finding out what poems could live where in part because as we all know as writers, like there's no, uh, poems often don't hold singular ideas or meanings, but you know it was also important for me to understand that um, I was kind of a, a bit of a tourist here, you know, in a in a, in a really vast history that um, I wasn't a part of, and so trying to honor the work and in, in in honor the the mission of the book through that was important too. Yeah, I'll just echo that and say like I feel like a very lucky like an extremely lucky guest um, in this process. Um, and just feel like really honored to have gotten to play any part, you know, I, at any time I've gotten to interact with anything having to do with Oak Park River Forest, like I've just been like, wow, I'm so lucky, you know? Um, and I felt that all the way through this process. Um, yeah. Um, this one is specifically for Ibrahim. What was your thought process when crafting your poem uh, and, and I, similarly, uh, the, what advice can you give someone just starting? That's a great question. Um, that piece is a uh, good four years old now. Uh, and I'm not gonna lie, I, I, the exact thought process is, is slightly forgotten. But what I do remember is that that piece took like, Usually for the showcases, we have like a deadline of like, okay, you have to have like the piece that you're performing by this time. I was like a good two weeks after the deadline is when it finally came together. Um, it, it very much was tossed together. There's just a variety of like just going back and forth um, and, and kind of cutting pieces from a bunch of little poems is what ended up with what we had there. Um, and so it is an older piece. And then that kind of middle part with all the rep repetition was added um, for the book in particular. Um, so that part is new. Um, but I would say as far as thought process goes, a lot of it was kind of a, what's the term? Uh, I was just speaking from the art or uh, spluttering of ideas on the page. Uh, a lot of it was just about my family, about my mother, who I love dearly. Um, and uh, as far as advice to someone who's just starting, I would honestly just say um, don't worry too much about like the details and like trying to make it perfect in any way. I don't think I've ever, you know, I'm not, I don't think I'm in any place to necessarily give advice, but I would say just write what makes you happy. And that's like, that's what I do. That's what I've always done. Um, I, you shouldn't be too worried about, you know, um, unless you're trying to be a professional, that is, um, trying to impress anybody or anything like that. Um, and you just write, 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 and it'll, you know, continue, you'll continue to improve. Awesome. Um, uh, so this other question, I'm, I'm curious to hear from Karina or, or Madge, see if you have any thoughts about this, but um, this question is, uh, how have your how has your skills and experience in spoken word contributed to what you're doing now? Um, and I just want to add, or even just uh, daily daily life as you go about your your daily life. Um, yeah, sure, I can definitely answer that. 
Um, spoken word has impacted my daily life in simply learning how to speak, um, learning how to present. I'm, a, I'm the vice coordinator for Black Affairs Council on my campus, so I have to oftentimes speak in front of people. I'm the president of Lift As We Climb, so I speak in front of people. With the cancer rehabilitation and research, I have to have um, empathy and sympathy, sympathy all the time with my patients and being quick on your feet. Um, being a spoken word, um, coming after class, you have to you have to quickly switch your brain to emotions. You have to quickly move back and forth. So um, that that is a skill that you use every single day. Um, yeah, I think that's good. Yeah, um, I'll just add on to that. I think, um, so I'm in this program first wave at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, which is a, a full tuition hip hop and urban art scholarship. And so we don't just get poets, we get actors, we get dancers, we get people who do music, people who rap, people who play instruments. Um, and I think a skill that I really learned in spoken word was how to collaborate with people that don't think like you. Um, and that's a really important skill. You know, I got to college and I realized that not everybody learned how to collaborate with people who were different than them. Um, and so I think that having the honor of being a spoken word captain and doing so many showcases in my high school career, um, you learn how people think and how people learn in different ways and you learn um, kind of what can turn people off to collaboration and what can turn people onto it. And that's really how you create the most beautiful group pieces. And so um, that's a skill that I definitely carry with me today um, as I move in the world with other artists um, and just as, as a human being myself. So, yeah. All right. Um, I, I want to turn into this is sort of this sort of um, continues in this line, but for, for if anyone else wants to share too, but if there's any helpful advice, um, activities or uh, habits um, in in spoken word club that, that helped you develop as a writer or even just maybe anecdotes about like something that happened uh, one time or, or something that you you uh, an anecdote about Peter maybe even or so, something that you continue to sort of like there's a memory that you take with you. Um. Now you're scaring me. I see a look in Langston's eye. I, I was gonna let someone else answer because my daughter is losing her mind in the background and I, I didn't want to uh, ruin things, but now you can hear her and me. Uh, <laughs> I, I'd say that, that uh, just, a lot of memories of, of Mr. Khan sort of being very, uh, <laughs> just very sort of uh, stringent about uh, the way that things needed to, to go in terms of fixing poems and sharpening poems and also appropriate behavior is uh, our fond memories. We, we used to, I don't know why I remember this, but we used to have like dance breakdowns uh, in, in our uh, slam team practices and I, I can fondly remember everyone dancing except Mr. Khan and somehow that that was just okay for him to just be standing sternly in a corner while the rest of us dance. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know, just a, a, his energy never changes and it is both why we love him so dearly and also what is so haunting about him. <laughs> Just, just to piggyback off that, I had a friend who, uh, a, a poet friend who came to visit the Spoken Word Club once, and he was really struck by um, how much uh, Pete actually resembled the Incredible Hulk. Uh, because if if people were talking over over him, or you know, people were getting too rambunctious, he would just stand in front of everyone and say, "I'm getting angry." everybody would stop everybody would stop um and um I, as far as uh being meticulous over the way that poems poems can work uh i i have a very specific memory of uh pk uh having langston practice saying the word buried instead of buried in his poem i still don't know which one's correct but yeah no we we spent a lot of time on it. Awesome. 
Um, this one is this one. This question is: Will the legacy of Spoken Word Club live on and be sustained into the future? Is there anything people can do from the outside to support the community, as well as buying and sharing this anthology? Uh, yes, it will continue on. There's too much of a. It's institutionalized in our school, and we have the support from the community, from teachers, from administrators, um, and just a wealth of talent who are still in the club and alumni who will come and make sure the club functions at a very high level. So I'm excited to see what comes next. I don't remember the second part of that question. I was still thinking about not dancing in front of Langston. I think the second part is, yeah, if there's anything people can do um, outside to support the community from the side. Um, I, you know, get the book, utilize our, our free website and, and get poetry in schools. So it's just a, a given like math class, right? It shouldn't just be Oak Park River Forest High School that, that has this program. This program should be all around the world. Um, and Raymond, who I think is here still, Raymond Antrobus can speak to what we're able to accomplish in London and, and get that going to some extent, but really it shouldn't be a privilege just to Oak Park. It should just be a given. So that would be what I would say. I'd also just add to that that, um... Uh, so many um, writers, activists, educators, spoken word uh, educators have come out of this program and are, um, uh, are teaching and working with people outside of the program. So even when it's not under the veil of OPRF, the, the tenements of the club and the legacy of the club lives on in those ways as well. Well, we're wrapping up soon, but I wanted to ask if anybody on this panel has questions for one another. Um, maybe, maybe that came up while anyone was talking or just something that you've wanted to ask Peter um, or Sully, but if, if you have any questions for each other, um, maybe that would be good to hear. I don't have a question, but I just wanted to express gratitude to, first off, like, Hannah and Rachel and everyone who worked on this book, but especially to, to Peter, who, you know, was like kind to me and brought me out to, to Oak Park Forest years ago and has since become a friend. And I think that they're, um, you know, they're the kind of educators you wish you had coming up. You know, I, I talked about how I didn't really have a, a poetry guide point when I was young and, and to get to see the work that Peter has done with like generations, like generations of folks. Um, who have lives far beyond where they began with him, but still really use him as a guidepost. Uh, it was a real honor to work this closely with Peter, who is who's truly uh, uh, an educator, who I, I think that uh, I am envious of the, the folks who get to work with him, but I really am glad that uh, you know he is present and will be present at least for a little bit longer. I'll second that uh, as far as um, um, giving a shout out to, to Rachel and Hannah who worked on this book uh, and, and helped bring it to life. Um, and, um, you know, just again, a special thanks to, to Franny and Hani for, for joining us um, on this journey. And also um, a shout out to uh, that flu game print you have, Hanif, behind you. Um, he, You've left quite a legacy and uh, I'm proud to call you my friend, proud to call you uh, my mentor. And um, yeah, this has been a beautiful night. Um, I'm so excited for this. Yeah, thank you all for being here. My, my panelists, friends, and people in the audience um, and women and children first and Penguin and yeah, wow, this is beautiful. This is beautiful. And um, I look forward to seeing what kind of momentum it carries with it and getting to see how, how these students progress in life and what impact they have on it. And yeah, it's just, a, it's been a, a pleasure and honor to get to work with Franny and Hanif and Sully. So thank you all. Thank, thank you. Thank you all again. This was really wonderful, uh, wonderful evening. There's so much love in the chat right now. If you haven't been keeping up, I suggest you scroll through it. Um, it's 
yeah, it's a, a big community, a big that that you've created and that everybody um, everybody's here for. So thank you. And um, everyone, if you uh, need that link again, we'll uh, drop it one more time in the chat for you to get the book um, and uh, continue to to uh, support local artists. <laughs> um, and thank you all so much for for coming out. And congratulations. Oh, and congrats on retirement. <laughs> Wait, can we can we all take a can we take a photo of us holding up the book before we go? Is that is that okay? Is that cute? Okay. I, I would have to I go guess get, hold on one second. I have my <laughs> come on. So it's maybe, like, maybe you got it. Majesty, still with it. us? Give me one second. Neve messing up the program. Wow. <laughs> We can we can Photoshop it onto Hanif's. <laughs> All right, HML took it. Yeah, I was going to say who's taking it. HML just took the picture. Tech, tech wizard. Uh, All right, we'll thank send you it out. Again. Thank you all. Wow, this is Thanks, lovely. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Wow. So